Welcome to Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly series where we select five patrons at random and examine cases related to their hometowns. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can support the channel on Patreon by following the link below. And now let's dive in with five cases from your hometowns, the mysteries that strike too close to home. But first, I'd like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's episode. The internet is an immensely important tool for us at Cold Case Detective, where the majority of our research takes place. It provides us with access to news and information, a place to share all of our documents and data, and various streaming platforms to find valuable wisdom on the topics we are covering. The problem is, sometimes that critical documentary isn't available in the country we're located, and public Wi-Fi leaves us concerned about sharing files across easily accessible servers. Luckily, with Surfshark VPN, those concerns are completely solved. Surfshark VPN is an unparalleled virtual private network. With unbelievably protective perks and easy-to-navigate security features meant to mask your online activity. All of your internet browsing, including where you're doing it from, is withheld via military-grade encryption to prevent people from snooping in. This allows you to share files safely, access your bank accounts, and feel confident wherever you are, even when using shared Wi-Fi. Surfshark VPN also allows you to change your location in real time to one of many servers found all over the globe. This means that if a certain film or documentary we need for research is unavailable in our country, we can simply travel to a different part of the world via Surfshark and access that media in a matter of seconds. It's a seamless process with zero risk attached. Surfshark VPN also includes a no strings attached, no logs policy, meaning your data will never be collected or sold no matter what. You can also enjoy the peace of mind of their cookie pop-up blocker and clean web initiative, where millions of phishing scams and malicious websites are automatically blocked at your convenience. Sign up for Surfshark VPN using the link in the description below and enter promo code COLDCASE for 83% off and an extra three months for free. The internet is an unpredictable place. Use the tools at your disposal to make it secure. Stephen Varley. Our first case this month comes from an anonymous patron who chose the location of St. Albans, England. On Sunday, December 19th, 1948, a local gardener rode his bike through an allotment footpath near a ruined nunnery in Cotton Mill Lane, St. Albans. What should have been an everyday event for the gardener became one of sheer horror when he discovered the body of a middle-aged man, only half-dressed and battered and bruised almost beyond recognition. The body was identified as 52-year-old Stephen Varley, whose wife had passed away just nine months earlier. Stephen was a former stoker with the Navy, or somebody who specialized in tasks concerned with the engine room, and prior to his death, he'd been working as a shop steward at the de Halavand Aircraft Works located in Hatfield. The 52-year-old's death had been violent. He had been brutally beaten, with his injuries showing that more than one person was responsible and he'd been strangled to death. His face and head had taken the brunt of the damage. Interestingly, Stephen's jacket and trousers were missing from the scene. His shoes had been removed, but they were located not too far from the body. He'd been left wearing his shirt, collar, tie, waistcoat, underwear, and socks. Investigators believed that Stephen had been carried around 100 yards down the path before he was dumped behind a wall of the ruins, out of sight. His body had been covered with his blue overcoat. Law enforcement theorized that Stephen had been a victim of burglary gone wrong. They believed multiple drunk men attacked him when he refused to hand over his valuables, and estimated that several pounds he had been carrying had been taken from him. Before his death, 
The 52-year-old had managed to hide a purse he'd had on his person. He'd hidden it not far from where he was found, and it contained his wife's engagements and wedding rings. Investigators were able to determine Stephen's last movements leading up to his time of death, which was estimated to be between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. on the 18th of December. Earlier that afternoon, he had taken his 10-year-old daughter to a children's party at his workplace. He left the event at around 7 p.m., alone, leaving his child in the care of a family friend. Stephen was then spotted getting on a bus for St. Albans at around 9 p.m. He lived on Westfield Avenue in Watford, so this was considered quite unusual. He never told his friends or anyone else at the party that he intended on going anywhere but home. Stephen arrived in St. Albans at around 10.30 that evening. At this point, the police are unsure of the 52-year-old's movements. Witnesses claimed that they saw him in the company of two men walking towards Cotton Mill Lane between 10.30 and 11.10 p.m., not far from where his body would later be found. However, authorities were never able to establish the identities of these two men. They wished to know who they were and how Stephen knew them, but were unable to answer both of these questions. The two men were reportedly seen leaving the lane at around 11.15 p.m. Investigators suggested that Stephen intended on returning home to Watford, but had missed the last bus from St. Albans. They theorized that the two men he was seen with had offered to show him a shortcut that would take him through to Abbey Station, where he could catch the last train home at 11.25 p.m. While here, on a quiet, isolated footpath, the men struck. Detectives also thought it was likely that Stephen had gone to St. Albans to meet someone, but they never found out who. Following the crime, the police appealed for further information from witnesses. They specifically asked an elderly woman and two girls to come forward, believing that they may have had some information that could help solve the case. It's unclear who any of these women were and what their connection was with the murder. On January 8th, 1949, less than one month after the crime, Blood-stained clothing was found discarded in Devizes, another town in England. Authorities believed that they belonged to one of the two men who'd participated in the slaying of Stephen Varley. The items included grey flannel trousers, grey socks, and a blue striped shirt. The shirt had a laundry mark on it, which read DI341PI, as did the socks, whose mark read TC8138. Reportedly at the time, there was only one laundrette in town. The workers there claimed that the police never spoke with them, and they never marked clothing at their establishment with letters. They added, quote, We know nothing of the bloodstained shirt. It seems that Stephen Varley's murder went cold following this discovery. Authorities inquired at secondhand shops, looking for his missing trousers and jacket, but never recovered the garments. The crime has never been solved. Teresa Martin. This case is brought to us by Jean-Michel Julien, who chose Montreal, Canada. On September 13th, 1969, at around 3.30 a.m., a man returning to his apartment on Henry Bourassa Boulevard in Montreal noticed something peculiar. Sitting on the ground and leaning up against a wall was a young girl. She was completely still, didn't say a word, and had bare feet. Concerned for her safety, the man slowly approached, calling out, but she didn't respond. When he reached her, he understood why. The young girl was dead. Police were promptly called to the scene, and authorities brought an ambulance with them. The young girl was taken to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead. There was nothing that could have been done for her. Meanwhile, a family a few blocks away wondered where their missing loved one was. 14-year-old Teresa Martin had headed out to see a film at the Galleries d'Anjou Cinema with two of her friends the night before and never returned home. Her friends confirmed that they'd seen her get on the bus to go home, the number 41, at around 11 p.m. that evening. The bus driver stated that she had exited the vehicle at the corner of Gwaine and Rowland, which was just two blocks from her family's apartment. This was the last time that anybody saw the 14-year-old alive. It wasn't long before authorities made the connection. Teresa's father was brought in to identify the body. A shy girl and a clever, hard-working pupil, Teresa had been due to finish her classical course at school around the time of her death. 
Her parents, a school teacher and a private investigator, had recently moved the 14-year-old and her siblings into a new home. They called Teresa a quiet, introverted teenager with few friends. She enjoyed horseback riding. The medical examiner concluded that Teresa had died from asphyxiation and noted it was the result of, quote, probable obstruction to her external airways. The teenager had not been sexually assaulted and there were no signs of drugs or alcohol in her system. Eerily, the culprit had engraved the words F.V. Frenchy, I love you into her stomach. Detectives have never been able to determine what this meant or if it was a red herring designed to throw off the investigation altogether. Notably, the path that Teresa would have taken to get home from the bus stop was a rather unpleasant one. In 1969, the area had no houses and little in the way of lighting, and she would be walking past vast, empty fields. It wasn't the safest place for anyone to be walking late at night, let alone a vulnerable teenage girl. In the weeks following her demise, 30 people were interviewed in connection with the case. However, progress was slow. It wasn't until a year later that investigators uncovered an interesting theory when they spoke with another 14-year-old girl named Joanne. During the 1960s, Montreal had a massive issue with local biker gangs who would harass and threaten citizens and essentially go to war with one another. The resulting complaints from both of these things overwhelmed the police force, to the point that one officer decided something needed to be done, and so, with the help of the government, he started the United Motorcyclists of Quebec, with the goal of making bikers more acceptable to society and uniting the different gangs. Following the creation of the organization, the government struck a deal with the oil company BP to let bikers use a vacant lot they owned on Henry Barassa Boulevard. The UMQ claimed they had tight control over the bikers and that all they did was meet up and ride around together. However, they continued to harass young women and girls and would threaten violence against any who rejected them. Joanne told investigators that members of the UMQ biker group hung out with students at parties and restaurants. She noted that they behaved like bullies and frequently threatened the young girls with violence. Joanne explained that they would force themselves onto the girls and threaten to hurt or kill them if they didn't comply, and that they carried knives around with them frequently and would use them to write on the girl's skin. She admitted that she had been a victim of sexual assault by the bikers and, as a result, had stopped hanging around with them. Joanne finished her discussion with the police by revealing that she had heard rumors that Teresa had been murdered by a member of the UMQ, but that she had not heard any details about why or how, and that she didn't know the name of the person who carried out the crime. She was also unable to tell investigators who had started the rumor because she had heard it from numerous different people. Teresa's family, for their part, are baffled by the biker theory. They noted that the 14-year-old was a homeboy and not overly social, and couldn't imagine her hanging around with bikers. However, it may be that Teresa was a random victim attacked by a biker who noticed her walking alone. She may not have been known to the perpetrator at all. In the last few decades, Teresa's case has remained cold. Her family have stated their belief that the police have a lack of interest in the crime and that progress in her case is incredibly slow as a result. Investigators appear to be waiting for the right person with the right information to call, rather than actively seeking answers. If you have any information about Teresa's case, you can call the Quebec Criminal Investigation Center on 1-800-659-4264. Kristen Ray Dunlap. The following case is brought to us by our patron B, who chose the location of Boise, Idaho. Described as a fiercely loyal girl with a spunky attitude, Kristen Ray Dunlap was born on January 24th of 1977. A middle child, Kristen is said to have had a rather troubled childhood that consisted of divorce, a blended family, and the death of her beloved father. She fought frequently with her family, but they all loved her very much. She was especially close to her younger brother, Daniel, who was seven years her junior. Her big sister, Crystal, recalled how often Kristen would laugh, stating, she loved to laugh. She made people around her happy. 
At the time of her disappearance in the mid-1990s, Kristen was a larger-than-life teenager who loved rock music, late-night adventures, and videotaping both herself and her friends and family. On October 14, 1994, Kristen left her family resident in Boise, leaving them with nothing but a note that stated she had to leave for a little while and should be back in a year. Her friend believed that the 17-year-old planned to go to Oregon to escape her boyfriend for a while. This wasn't the first time that Kristen had run away from home. In fact, it was something she had done regularly throughout her life. However, she had never left for more than a week without checking in with her friends and family. At first, the 17-year-old didn't completely vanish off the radar. Investigators later found that she had initially gone to McCall, Indiana, where she had acquired a job at a hotel, but only turned up for one shift. Acquaintances and friends reported hearing from her up until mid-December that year. After that, she vanished. She also stopped collecting the social security benefits she had been receiving since her father's demise. At the time of her disappearance in October of 1994, Kristen had been seeing a man named Charles Castro, who was 10 years her senior. They had reportedly met two years earlier, making Kristen just 15 at the time. Her friends and family strongly disliked Castro, noting that he was far too old for her, already married, and physically abusive. Kristen's mother, Kim, had attempted to intervene and pushed to have statutory rape charges laid against Castro, as she had evidence that the two were in a sexual relationship. But reportedly, both the police and prosecutors in Boise declined to press charges. Castro allegedly threatened the 17-year-old to stop her from reporting him to the police and repeatedly told her he was seeking a divorce from his wife. He had previously spent time in prison for theft and was on parole at the time of Kristen's disappearance. He claimed he'd cut off communication with her around this time because his parole officer told him he had to. Four years later, in 1998, Castro was charged with sexual assault after he interfered with his new girlfriend's young daughter. As a result, he was placed on the sex offender's register and spent 10 years in prison. He was questioned about Kristen's disappearance in 2011, where he claimed he was innocent and took a polygraph test, which he passed. He denied knowing that she'd ever been in McCall when he had been there at the same time, and also said that they rarely fought. According to one report, Kristen went to a friend's on the day of her disappearance, where Castro found her and the two allegedly left together. In January of 2022, Castro was killed by police officers in Murphy, Idaho. They were reportedly called to his home to serve him with a civil protection order, which would require him to move out of the home he lived in with his wife. However, according to the officers, he quickly became agitated and charged at them while holding a weapon. He refused to drop the weapon, and so he was shot. Kristen is still missing, and her case is mostly cold at this point. She was initially labeled as a runaway until 1998, when her case status was changed to endangered missing. Foul play is suspected in her case, and her family strongly believe that Castro was responsible for her death. They also believe that the Boise PD didn't take the case seriously at first because Kristen had a history of running away. Her mother, Kim, has spent her life pressuring the police to keep the case alive and has also hired private investigators to look for her missing daughter. No suspect has ever been named by law enforcement, and no search warrants have ever been served. 17-year-old Kristen Ray Dunlap was last seen leaving her home in Boise, Idaho on October 14, 1994. At the time, Kristen was 140 pounds and stood at 5 foot 4. She is described as a white woman with blonde hair and green eyes. She wears glasses and has a one-inch scar on her buttocks. She uses the name Christy and may use the last name Bose or Dunlap Bose. She also has ADHD. If Kristen is still alive, she will be 45 years old. If you have any information about her disappearance, you can call the Boise Police Department on 208-377-6790. William John Davis. The following case is brought to us by our patron Abe Morrison Bald, who chose the location of St. Ives, England. At around 4 p.m. on March 14, 1907, Mrs. Davis, the wife of a fisherman named William Davis and the mother of four children, including four-month-old William John Davis, 
placed her baby in a cradle in the kitchen with a pacifier. She had some errands to run, but wouldn't be gone long, and felt it would be easier for her to go now while her youngest son slept. Mr. and Mrs. Davis lived in what was described as a thickly populated slum district in St. Ives, England. The housing was cheek to jowl, the main road was frequently covered in water, and the neighborhood was largely occupied by local boatmen and fishermen and their families. The couple lived in a small home located over a stable, where the grim smells of animal feces permeated the walls. They'd been married for around 25 years, and together had around 19 children, although only four survived. Three had been stillborn, the others perishing from natural causes. Infant mortality rates in the area were reportedly extremely high, even for the time. As William slept, Mrs. Davis did some washing and then left for the local bakery. She also planned to pick up her daughter, and as she headed for home, she noticed 14-year-old Thomas Pullmore sitting on his parents' doorstep. She asked him if he'd seen her daughter, and Thomas replied that she was down at the beach. Mrs. Davis then went on her way, but found that her child wasn't where he'd said she was. She doubled back the way she came, and noticed Thomas was now gone. She continued on her way, and a short time later, found her daughter at her grandmother's. All in all, Mrs. Davis was away from home for around 40 minutes. Upon her return with her daughter, she ran into Mrs. Polmore. The trio entered the house together, and inside, discovered one of Cornwall's most gruesome crimes. Baby William had been slashed in the neck before he was decapitated, his body lying on the floor, his head in the fireplace fender. The coroner later deduced that the baby had four superficial wounds on his face. His head had been scorched from the burning fire, which had been set a while before his mother had left the home, and that he may have been decapitated in the water, or his body was placed in the water afterwards. This conclusion was reached due to the fact that William's clothing was soaking wet. He and his garments smelled strongly of paraffin. A lamp had been knocked over on the kitchen table. Blood stains were found on the wash tray, which had been half filled when Mrs. Davis left. The killer left behind virtually no trace of themselves at the scene. There had been no sound nor any commotion reported by neighbors. Several knives were located in the kitchen, but none showed any evidence they had been tampered with or used in the crime. There was no sign of blood on any of them. Additionally, the wash tray had been upturned, backing up the suggestion that William had at some point been placed in the water. Mrs. Davis recalled that she'd left a sharp bread knife out on the kitchen table, which was missing from the scene, as was a box of matches. There was no obvious motive that the police could find. According to Mrs. Davis's testimony at the inquest, Thomas was known to frequent her house. He would sneak in and steal items, and for that reason, she had barred him from entering her home for two weeks. When she and his mother discovered William's body, Mrs. Davis had exclaimed that Thomas must have been in the house. However, when Mrs. Pullmore noted the baby's body and pointed it out to her, she said William must have been attacked by a dog. Thomas was described as being a boy of weak intellect. Following the discovery of William's body, investigators went out to see the teenager who was with his grandmother. Upon seeing the policeman, he said, quote, baby's head cut off. His grandmother then shook him and told him to be quiet. Shortly after this interaction, Thomas was taken into custody and accused of the crime. At the inquest, the county coroner, Edward Bowes, went over the events of the day and summarized William's murder before stating it was obvious that a criminal event had occurred in the case. A laborer who spoke at the inquest claimed he saw Thomas playing on the steps of the Davis's house after Mrs. Davis left, but he was unable to confirm whether or not the teenager had entered the property. Another witness, Thomas's nine-year-old brother, said he hadn't seen him enter or exit the house all day. Between 2 and 4 p.m., Mr. Polmore claimed that his son was with him. Notably, after hearing about the murder, Mr. Polmore went looking for Thomas and told the inquest that he didn't want anybody to see his son near the house. Furthermore, his nine-year-old son testified that he had burned Thomas's boots following the crime, but Mr. Polmore denied ever doing this. The coroner noted that the mortality rate of Mr. and Mrs. Davis's children was very high and found it odd that Mrs. Davis had cleaned up after finding her child dead. However, she claimed it was because she didn't want the authorities who entered her home thinking she was a dirty woman. In the end, there simply wasn't enough evidence against Thomas to convict. The murder of William John Davis is still unsolved. 
Jacob Cabinor. Our final case for this month comes from Traverse City in Michigan. Our patron Laura originally chose the village of Beulah in this same state. However, we were unable to find anything from around this area, and so we widened our search and discovered an odd missing persons case from 2010 in Traverse City. Jacob Cabanor was an ordinary 31-year-old man living an unassuming life when he uncharacteristically went missing in the spring of 2010. A divorced father of two, Jacob was described as an attentive father and somebody who worked hard. He had a job he loved at Dave's Garage and had invested in $20,000 worth of tools over the years. Furthermore, he was a member of the National Guard and was a technical science student at Northwestern Michigan College. By all accounts, Jake enjoyed life and would always keep himself busy. His sister noted that he didn't use drugs, wasn't an alcoholic, and made a point of staying out of trouble. At around 7.30 on the evening of March 31st, 2010, Jake dropped off his friend, a man named Gary Wittig, near the volleyball courts at Open Space in Traverse City, a beachside park, after the pair played frisbee golf together. Wittig asked Jake if he wanted to do some bar hopping with him, but the 31-year-old declined, stating that he had to go home and study for class. However, after Jake left Wittig, he never returned home. At 1 a.m. on the morning of April 1st, Jake made his monthly phone call to the National Guard's automated phone system, where he reported that he was still a student at Northwestern Michigan College. An hour later, Jake used his bank card to buy gas at a speedway off Interstate 94 in Matawan, Michigan, about three hours from his home. CCTV footage from the scene was examined by his family, who confirmed that it was indeed the 31-year-old on tape. Just after midnight on April 2nd, a police officer in Hollister, Missouri ran his license plate. It was run again by a Washington County Sheriff's Department deputy in Arkansas a few hours later at around 3 a.m. The officer reportedly witnessed Jake in his vehicle, sleeping while he parked at the Brentwood Rest Area of US-71 in West Fork. It is unknown at this time if he was alone, but the lead detective working on the case in 2020 requested both the body cam footage and the audio recording of the officer's interaction with Jake that night. Later on that same day, his card was used to buy gas again at Skinny's 7-Eleven in Sweetwater, Texas. An image of the man paying was once more captured on CCTV, but his family could not positively identify him as Jake. The 31-year-old's only known connection to Texas is that his brother is stationed in Fort Hood. Jake's card has not been used since Sweetwater, and there has been no trace of him since the gas purchase on April 2nd. His car has never been located. He reportedly had insufficient funds in his bank account to pay for his gas, but was able to do so thanks to an overdraft. Jake did not have his phone charger with him when he went missing, and his phone has not been used since he vanished. Online sleuths have pointed out that there are around 1,600 miles between two of the gas stations Jake's card was used at, leading to many questions about who paid for the gas in between these times and where he stopped to refill. It has been suggested that there was someone else traveling with him. According to friends and family, Jake's friend, Gary Wittig, whom he supposedly dropped off on the day of his disappearance after they played frisbee golf, left the city around the time of the 31-year-old's disappearance. He reportedly failed to account for his whereabouts when he was questioned by Jake's loved ones. On October 5th, 2012, over two years after Jake went missing, a polygraph test was issued as part of the ongoing investigation. However, it has not been made public who was given the test. Reportedly, the name has been redacted in the case file. A year later, Jake's ex-wife, Rachel, contacted the lead detective at the time, Paul Gomez, to say that $1,500 had mysteriously appeared in her bank accounts. She called them and told them it was from the Army National Guard Thrift Savings Plan, of which her ex-husband was a member. Rachel theorized that if the money had been deposited into her accounts, it would have been done so by Jake, and he must be alive. However, Gomez discovered that friend of the court had made the transfer, but had refused to give Rachel this information. Then in 2014, Gomez discovered that someone had filed a 2013 Michigan tax return in Jake's name. He sent a search warrant to the state's treasury department, which revealed that the return had been filed by a Kent Shea with a Houston, Texas address. 
Further investigation by the FBI showed it had been fraudulently filed via a series of shell real estate companies. Jake's case is still open and active. In 2020, Jason Polzine, the Grand Traverse County detective who is still running the investigation, sought information on Jake's missing vehicle and requested help from the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Polzine discovered that there was a hit on the 31-year-old's vehicle in Mexico, likely from an impound lot. A report on the case states, quote, the current status of the vehicle is unknown. It is believed that the car was crushed or destroyed. As previously mentioned, Polzine also requested the body cam footage and audio from an officer who interacted with Jake in the early hours of April 2nd, 2010. In 2015, Jake was declared legally dead. He is still listed as endangered missing on his Charlie Project page, and initially, law enforcement believed that the 31-year-old had left of his own accord. His family and friends disagree, however, noting that he wouldn't leave without telling anyone and he would not walk out on his children. Due to the nature of the case, there have been numerous theories proposed over the years. That Jake left of his own accord but met with foul play or became involved in an accident, that he left of his own accord to take his own life, or that he left due to mental illness. Some have even suggested that he needed money and agreed to participate in a drug run to Mexico. In recent years, with the sketchy behavior of Gary Wittig, who refuses to comment on the case, many have proposed the theory that he was involved with whatever happened to Jake. Jacob was last seen on March 31st, 2010 in Traverse City, Michigan. His debit card was used to purchase gas in Matawan, Michigan and in Sweetwater, Texas, while his vehicle was seen in between those two stops at Brentwood Rest Area of US 71 in West Fork on April 2nd. His card has not been used since Sweetwater and his phone has not been used since he went missing. Jake is described as a Native American man of Ottawa and Chippewa Indian descent with brown hair and brown eyes. He is between five foot 10 and six foot two and weighs between 160 to 175 pounds. When he was last seen, he was wearing his work uniform, which consisted of gray trousers, a white or orange t-shirt, and a gray jacket with Dave's Garage printed on it. He also wore brown work boots. He uses the nickname Jake. Jake's vehicle is described as being a 2002 silver Chevrolet Malibu with Michigan license plate BKQ4107. It has minor damage to the front passenger and side panel and has not been concretely located as of yet. If Jake is still alive, he will be 43 years old. If you have any information about his disappearance, you can contact the Grand Traverse County Sheriff's Office on 231-995-5002, or you can email info at gtsheriff.org. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.